Hey guys, I'm making trumpet bells. One of my favorite things to do, and you know this if you come around and hang out, like Ian and Adam and John do, if there's a TV or a computer around and we're sitting there and we're bored, what I will do is I will just put on YouTube videos of instrument making. It's how I learned how to make instruments is by watching those YouTube videos. I never really had a formal teacher. I was around some people who were doing instrument making about three years in them when I, from when I started and to be honest, they were kind of idiots and they were very sketchy business people. So I left there very quickly. So I didn't really get a lot of experience. And I started on my own and I got here. So I owe a lot of what I have to other makers putting stuff on YouTube, whether they intended it to be used as a learning tool or just marketing, it doesn't matter. I learned a lot from it. What to do, what not to do, mistakes that other companies have made in the past, stuff like that. And one of these videos, like one of the oldest ones on there is the making of Selmer trumpets, I think it's called. And it's the old Selmer France, the Selmer Paris factory, I think Paris. We'll link to the video. I got snow, soap all on my nose. In that Selmer video, there's a few remarkable things that they do. Um, and probably the coolest thing that I've not seen anywhere else is when beating a bell, yeah, I sneeze. Okay, so when beating a bell, you use a tool like this to pull out the material. While the lathe is spinning, you pull out the material to a 90 is what I call it. And that gives you, that's the first step to forming the bead. So I've only ever seen it done with this tool or a roller or even just a spinning tool. If you're really good and your material's thick, you can do that. But with thinner bells, you really need a slip tool. And I could tell it looked like the material was like 023 or 025, maybe even thicker, which is closer to what I do, like 020 is my standard, then um, spun horn flare is usually 025 at the flare just because it's the thickest part. So you can spin that out with a stick tool. But with this, you really need a, a slit tool. But the way they do it, and we can probably steal some footage from it, I don't think anyone's gonna yell at us, is they basically take, in the lathe, they take the bell, so our bell is spinning legs like this when I use a slip tool. What they do is they take the bell in a different lathe with a kind of reverse mandrel. That's the diameter of the bell they want finished. And they actually take the rim back and spin it back over a mandrel, which gives you a perfect shape for a bead, at least a starting shape. And I wanna to try to make that tooling and try that today, because I think that would be really, really, really consistent if I can get that good. At least I can get it pulled out consistent, because one of the most inconsistent parts of my process is pulling out the 90. Part of it is because I'm not too practiced at it. By the time I get good at it, I'll stop making trumpet bells for a couple months because I don't get it, or you know, I work out all my orders and then I get good at it by the end of the orders. You know, if I'm making 10 bells, I'll be good at it on the back half of that 10. But then I'll sit for a couple months and not have to do it and then I'll get rusty again. It just holds a whole thing. Obviously, it's still a good skill to have. It's still a skill that I will use because I'm not gonna have a mandrel for every flare. But trumpet bells are, in my opinion, the hardest ones to do. I can do horn bells one piece all day long because bigger diameter, the SFM surface speed per minute is a lot higher, so it makes it a lot easier. Because what happens, what can happen when using a slip tool, so with a thin trumpet bell, you have to be really quick when you do it. Because if you get your tool in here, grabbing on the bead just like this, and then you dwell while the lace spinning, if you just hold your tool on the bell right there, it's gonna harden up immediately. Okay, it takes a very, very little amount of time for this bell to harden up on you and then you gotta flatten it out and re-anneal. And it's not the end of the world, you can get it. But what, what'll happen is if you dwell and then you go to try to turn the 90 out, it's that kind of motion, you actually twist your tool. You twist counterclockwise so that you're holding even pressure. So you can see on my slit tool, see if that comes up in camera. One half is thinner, this half is thinner than the other. The thinner half goes against the mandrel, gives you more clearance. So you actually take the tool and you get it on the bell like that and you're actually gonna twist your tool very subtly. It'll depend on the size of your slot. So this slot's kind of worn out, so I'll twist a little bit more to get contact even. You don't wanna twist too much, but while you're twisting counterclockwise, so that way, counterclockwise of the rotation of my hand. So that way, we're twisting that way. Really subtly though, not as, not as extreme. So you're twisting, you're actually gonna twist and you're gonna pull it out like that, okay? But a lot of times you can get fastening because the bell hardens up too quick. Cause you really, like real time, you have to go, you, so I'm off the material, ready? And then on, and then you gotta go with thin bells, like really quick. It should be a quick motion because otherwise you're gonna harden it, get fastening. You can fix the fastening and it's not a big deal. What I do is I have a whale tool. This is my beating tool. I call it the whale tool because it looks like a whale, whale tail. And when you get fastening, what I do is I take this and I just put it on the inside of the bead, I do this anyways, even without faceting. This is the shape of the inside of, actually, this one is the shape of the inside of my bead. So I put it in there and then you 
push it out to fix that fastening. And sometimes you'll still have a little bit left. And then I have these. These are kind of makeshift spinning pliers. They don't work as spinning pliers. Some people use, I don't get how it works. I think, I don't know. I don't think my spinning lathe rests is high enough for it, but some people use these to hold on to it and turn it out to 90 instead of the slip. I just use these to smooth out that bead if there's any waves in it. That process has worked so far for me. It's not the most exact process and I have lost bells because sometimes when it facets, if it just is, to, if there's a thin spot or anything like that, you'll get a tear. My goal here is to make some mandrels to reverse spin this so that we won't get any tear on the spin out, on the pull out. So our goal is to have a really consistent shape to start forming the bead. So I don't want to go directly from this mandrel to put in wire in it because what I want to do is I want to still use my whale tool to form that bead. But the other thing about this, is I think I can make the mandrel in such a way that it will be perfect. So I started doing French beads. I want to structure this mandrel so that it's perfect for a French bead. And the difference between a French bead and a conventional bead is the shape of the bell rim. So French beads use a half round wire, which is very hard to get. And then when you get it, you have to rework it. It's a half round wire instead of a fully round wire like normal. On a traditional bead, outside shape of the bell rim is round. The part where the zero point of the bell, so let's say the, the flat of the rim is the zero point, and the x-axis come together is a sharp point. Okay, you put your half round wire in and then you just form the bell over that half round. It looks like there's a half round piece of wire just soldered to the rim, but it's a bead. That's different than a normal bead where it's the round shape of the wire. And when you're doing a French bead, you need to make sure that you have a really sharp 90 coming off of the bell mandrel or else it's gonna look like a round wire and there would be space between the bead material and the bell, which could dent very easily and just not be a good bell. And you see that on some old instruments. But we want a really sharp 90 so that that edge of that half round wire fits perfectly in there that we can form around it. And I think I'm gonna optimize my reverse bandrels for the half round wire because I know to form my bead for a round wire, I wanna use the whale tool anyways because I find this is the most consistent way to get a good shaped bead. So we're gonna make inverse mandrels a little bit undersized by probably about 25 thousandths so that when I can go in the whale tool, I just have to really lightly touch the whale tool. And the other thing this will do is with the reverse mandrels, we accidentally pull them, like disrupt the shape of the bell. With the whale tool, we'll start a little farther back, probably about three quarters of an inch off the, man, off the bead. And we'll run that just along that rim to one, make sure that we have a hard temper at the bead because when we before we go to pull out, we will anneal it. So we're gonna make sure that that annealing didn't leach too far down the bell because otherwise if a kid ever goes like this with the bell on a table, you're gonna have a lot worse damage if it's annealed. But we're gonna bring that up to hardness and then we're just gonna reach in that corner and tuck it out just so we get that shape that we want. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna final spin this bell. I'm gonna final spin these other three too. And then we will go to the Cincinnati and start turning on that piece of steel I got for one of the reverse mantles. Old saw blade I cut into a skiving tool. So a couple tips about beading. These actually will become less important with this technique, with the new mandrel. When you're beading a bell, that's a one-piece bell. If you're beading two-piece bells, you don't have to worry about this. This is the reason that two-piece bells are more common in factories, okay? It's not because a one-piece bell takes longer to make. It really doesn't. It's because of the inconsistencies that you have to fight along the way to do with the seam. So when you braise a bell and you roll out the seam, your seam is always gonna be taller, still more diameter of material. So this is an 020 bell, but on the seam, I would guess it's about 030 in the flare. In the tail, it rolls out pretty good, but something about the flare does not wanna roll out. I think it's because the amount of braise that goes into the flare material is more than into the tail. And it's just kind of the nature of a seam. So when before you bead a bell, you have to make sure that you really, really get that seam to the same thickness or less, preferably less, by a couple thousands than the bell material around the seam. And there's a couple ways I do that. One, throughout the process, I planish that seam about three times. So before I roll the seams, I will hand hammer, just with the planishing hammer I have, the bell seam at the flare, just because it'll help it roll out better. You don't go crazy, about 20 hits maybe from here to here. And then I will roll out the seam and then you check. You see how raised it is. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna be rolled up perfectly from the tail all the way up to here and then you're gonna have little islands of braids that haven't been rolled up perfect. They're rolled out really good, but not perfect. You'll see little 
they look like cracks around them, but it's not cracks. It's just a place where the material isn't down to the proper size. You can keep annealing and keep rolling it, but what's gonna happen is you're gonna get down to thickness properly up here, but then back in the tail, you're gonna be down really thin. And yeah, you can flip the stake over and only roll the front here, but then that causes some other issues of inconsistencies. Best thing to do, and this is another thing I learned from YouTube, Bach, no matter the issues they have with their bell making process, their rolling seams in a pretty, like there's no way to not roll seams pretty good. So they're rolling the tail all the way up to here on a seam roller and the flare they're doing on a planishing hammer. I like to do the flare still on a seam roller just because I can. They, their pattern, they'd have to fold it because it's the hydroformed one that's like a wet noodle. They'd have to fold that thing so many times to do it on a seam roller. People do it, does it. Their pattern's not quite as aggressive because it's not hydroformed yet. Yep. Yeah. We're watching you, poo series. I skive there to brighten up the surface, get that spinning lines off. And what that does is that gives me a good idea of how thick my seam is. And because I planished with a hand hammer before I rolled, I planished with my air-operated planishing hammer after I rolled. That's before inside spinning. Then after inside spinning, it's kind of crazy because after after seam rolling and planishing on the air hammer, I got the seam down to the same thickness as the bell material around it, or really close, like plus or minus five thousandths. Then after inside spinning, this material up here is thinner now than this material down here. So what happens is the seam that's bearing not bearing bronze. It's uh, basically nine thirty-two bronze braze wire, that braze does not thin out or expand at the same rate as the brass around it. So what happens is you end up with islands again because the brass around the braze has thinned out but the braze has stayed the same because of it's less work hardening than brasses, okay? So that bronze takes an anneal better than the brass around it. It's kind of crazy. You see this as a big issue if you're working the red brasses. Uh, C220 commercial bronze is a pain with bronze braze and one piece bells because it's actually the opposite spectrum. The commercial bronze works much easier than the bronze brazing wire. So what happens is the bronze brazing wire will harden up before the commercial bronze and then after about two rounds, you usually see it in inside spinning steps. If you're too aggressive with the commercial bronze, you have to really limit yourself to how much you're moving because if you're too aggressive, you'll actually see cold shuts form around the braze. So if like, you have any little extra spots of braze that they roll out fine, but then you'll see little cracks fold form all around the braze and that's how you know you're working the material too fast. And it's not because the bronze can't take it, it's because, sorry, it's not because the bell material can't take it, it's because the brazing material can't take, can't take it. Kind of a thing that took me a lot of years to figure out because I was just messing up bells and bells. And it still happens because you just, when you're inside spinning, it feels like you keep going and keep going and keep going. After inside spinning, you'll have to planish it again. And if you don't do this, you're gonna have a really, really, really hard time making bells and getting beads. You'll get hundreds of bells spun down final spun. But when you go to bead them, you're gonna have a hard time. You can't just sand that away on the lathe because if you're sanding on the lathe, you're sanding all around. So if you have 10 thousandths of buildup on your seam, by the time you get that 10 thousandths to sand it down, you're gonna have a 6 thousandths thick bell over here, okay? It's just not gonna work because then you're not gonna be able to bead it because it's gonna harden so fast. So you really need to planish. You can do it with a hand hammer all, all the times. I find the air hammers really more consistent especially on a thinner bell. Thicker bells you can hand hammer pretty easy. I used to do all the seams hand hammered, but it's just a lot of a lot of wear on your arms. The air hammer is sweet though. I, I'll show some pictures of it or we'll walk over there. I bought an air planishing hammer set up like for cars on eBay. It was $179 and I cut it, welded it, and put some new stuff on it. It took me like an hour. And that thing single-handedly has made my life so much easier in the last year than any other tool I bought in the last five years. Like that thing is a lifesaver. Could not be making the quality of bells I'm making now without it. And like I said, that thing was 170 bucks, maybe 10 bucks in steel that I had to weld onto it, so. With this new setup, the reverse mandrel, we'll have to find a fun name for it. I don't think this is gonna be as important. I think I'm still gonna shoot for it just for the intent of making it even thickness, but I should be able to actually not force the material, but make the material round. Because if you have too much material over your bead, you can pull a 90 out, say like five or 10 thousandths of material, too much. You can pull a 90 out, but when you put the, when you fold the bead over, your bell's gonna be round, 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 wherever there isn't a bead. And then there's gonna be a flat spot over where the brazing is. And that's because that material is too thick and did not work as easily as the brass around it. And that is my pet peeve. You see it on a lot of bells. It's just about how much attention you pay to that bell. You gotta really concentrate and fix your mistakes. 
Oh, I want to show something else, Colin. One of the biggest issues I've had with bell making is having bells push off of the lathe when I'm spinning the flare down. Not as big of an issue on trumpets, but on trombone especially. It's a huge problem. You gotta think, a trumpet doesn't taper nearly as rapidly as a trombone. Back here, it's basically, not basically a straight tube, but it goes from 460 here to 420 in the span of about four inches, okay? That's a very shallow taper. But on a trombone, you'll have to go from like 1.2 inches to like 600 in the span of like four inches. It's a really aggressive taper. And what happens is the trumpet mandrels or trumpet bells are able to lock on the mandrel with friction a lot more than a trombone. We do have a bolt on here, but the friction really helps it hold and stop rotationally stops it from twisting and stuff like that. On a trombone, if you're spinning up here on like a Bach 42 especially is bad about this, it'll try really hard to back off of the mandrel and you'll get little pileups here. And that bell is still usable, but the issue here is with how tight that bell is to the mandrel. If the bell moves at all this way, what happens is we just drew this bell. This draw, and I draw with my material, the PETG is the most accurate draw I've ever had. So we are getting that draw. The point of that draw is to give us a consistent shape of bell. And if you draw and then you spin tight, you have actual consistency in the shape of your bell. If you draw, you spin, and you get some pileups back there, what happens is this entire bell just shifted down, the taper of the bell shifted down, and your bell just got longer because you spun it down. It happens right here. Your shape changes in your throat, which is a huge contribution to how a trumpet plays is in the throat or a trombone. That is a lot where a lot of the shape of the bell matters is right in that throat. So if you're, if you're extending that throat, you're changing a lot about an instrument. That's one of my main ideas to why factory instruments play so rapidly different, or at least factory bells, is because I have seen in factories pileups like crazy. Okay, so this is my way to fix it, to make it not happen. When I draw bells, that is what my nose looks like. So I do this with a draw plate and I just hammer the draw plate onto the bell, bring a shoulder down like that, okay? And I leave it long so that way it holds on to the drawing material that has a hole through it. This sits on there and it's really nice. And then what I do now, after it's ready to spin, I'll take my shears just on the lathe here and I'll just trim that back so that it's only sitting forward about an eighth of an inch, okay? So we have an eighth of an inch straight nose that's sitting up there, okay? So it's just a quarter 20 hex head bolt, and then I take a 3816 nut, and I put that on there, and the quarter 20 obviously goes into the mandrel, and the 3816 actually threads onto the bell. And what this does is this gives us some positive holding power, and you can see I'm shroomed up the tiniest amount. So this, this bell backed off like 20 thousands, which in my book is acceptable, okay? It's always gonna do a little bit. Another way you can mitigate this is by taking a trombone mouthpiece, and I do this, and when the bell's on the lathe, you smack it on there so you harden that nose if it wasn't already hardened from the draw. If I were to do any of these final spins, and if I were to, this one was just drawn, okay, this bell, just drawn. If I were to anneal just that very last quarter inch of that bell, and try to final spin, we would get like three pileups, guaranteed. With this method, we don't really get that. And that's been a huge, huge game changer for my productivity. Look how pretty those look. I love that skived finish. So we are going to finish, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish spinning these two, and then uh, we will go and make some tooling. So we are over here at the Cincinnati. So I haven't really thought what they should look like. So in the video, the summer video, they don't really show what the mandrel looks like. They just show the process, which has the bell sandwiched between the mandrel, which is in the chuck or on the, on the lathe spindle, and a disc in the tail sock of like wood that just holds the bell flat. So we're just kind of kind of winging it. And this is kind of what I think it probably would be. And that is it's a five and seven sixteenths inch piece, two inches long. So we're gonna turn it down to five inches, I think is what these bells are supposed to be. Five inches is standard, so I'm gonna do five inches anyway. And I wanna do four and seven eighths. I have to look through my emails and the orders and see what they are. But whatever the orders are for, I'm doing this for. So we are gonna do, let's say five inches. So we're gonna turn this to like 4.9, I think 4.95. So that's 25 thousandths a side. I think that's good. And uh, we're gonna drill it out, bore it out so that it has clearance for the bell to fit through obviously. And then we're gonna turn a little taper to match up with the flare of the bell. Again, we're gonna touch that up once we're back on the lathe so it doesn't have to be too. Little trick, if you step on the clutch, it won't let the spindle rotate. Wow, so I just figured out Colin 
that I was filming at one percent one time zoom for the last like two years. Apparently you can zoom out. It looks a lot better. So we're gonna grip it with the jaws this way because it's definitely the right way to do it and not because I'm too lazy to flip the jaws. Definitely what's going on. Oh, I'm gonna have to flip the jaws. I don't wanna flip them. Okay, uh, well that's it for this video. I'm kidding. Seems like the jaws are never in the right orientation for the thing you need to do at this minute. I'm flipping these like daily. Usually I do this with an impact driver. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm too lazy to find it. And you really want to make sure to clean these when you put them back in. I did that off camera, obviously. Um, they definitely don't have angle grinder dust in them. You know, just so you know, they are clean. The worst thing ever is when you're flipping jaws and then you put the jaw back on, but you put it back on in the way that you just tried to flip it from <laughs> because you're an idiot. And it's like the worst feeling in the world. Okay. Look at that. So my three jaw is really good. It's like the only three jaw in the world that actually runs through. So we're using a CNMG. Well, pick doesn't matter. My tool height just wrong. But we're drilling this baby out. Whoever said I'm not safe. I got new calibers. I highly recommend them. These are the Cool Improve IP67s. These are sweet. 5.3 still. Let's do some big honking cuts. You guys want to see some big honkers? We'll do some big honkers. Let me drill this out real quick and get it centered in there. Here we go. 196 RPM. That few rate we were just doing was a. That was 7,000 per gram. That's 200. We're at 5.1, so it'll we'll take 100. We're gonna up the feet, up the speed to 356. So to get half inch depth to cut on this thing, so actual depth to cut, not removal. So inch removal, you go down to like 100 RPM, 96 RPM, and you go down to like 2,000s of rev, and you just shave that. I'm gonna put my shield back on because these might be coming off pretty grip, pretty aggressive at me. Great. Those are more appropriate chips. Those are 503, so we're gonna do 80, 25, 50, 75, 80. That should be on the size. Yep. I'm good with that. So now we're gonna drill it out and shape that, uh, shape that thing. Drill this out, but it takes forever. So. Oh, you know what? It might have big drill bits. I'm trying to find a big drill bit. That was like a three-quarter inch hole. Yeah, that was, that was a five-eighths inch hole, and they get some big drill bits. Not giant, but it's pretty big. Inch and five-eighths. I think it's more stick three, it looks like it. Oh, no, that's probably four. Kind of depressing. Yeah, it's four. I'm gonna try more stick three. Okay. We have an inch and 1564s, whatever the hell it is. I'm gonna move my camera, too. I was 100% blocking the view last time. Hopefully this drill's sharp. Sounds like you loved it, but it did it. Probably went a little too fast speed wise, and obviously I didn't put any cutting oil on it. Because I'm a heathen. I really need like a two inch drill bit. That's more staple three. I don't, I don't know if they make them that big. Need more staple three. Okay, now we start boring. Nope. So I skipped ahead a little bit, my camera died. So you can see that. I turned that taper. All I did is the top slide, set it to an arbitrary angle, and I just took me two tries to get the right angle for the belt. First one was too shallow, so I just made it a little steeper, and it turned out great. Fits really nice. This doesn't need to fit perfect. This just needs to cradle the belt, kind of help center it, hopefully. That's the only thing I'm worried about, is whether this design, this idea, will be centered enough, or if I need a full reverse manual to do this, which I'm not interested in doing. My comments before about the French bead. I am coming back on that. I'm gonna make this so that off the manual, it'll do my standard bead perfect. And then if I need to adjust it, adjust the bell individually, I'll do that for a French bead. So this is gonna be perfect for standard bead. I'm actually gonna use my CNMG tool to rough it in. I'm on a weird angle, but it should be okay. Okay, I 
like that. Something else I thought about that might be a good idea is to add a little bit of draft to the face of the mandrel. So taper this way to prevent bells from getting stuck on here. So I'm gonna do that with the file too. Should have done that before. Uh, the touch up the beat again. Cool. And now all we're gonna do is we're gonna polish the inside. It doesn't need to be super high polished, but just a little bit will help. Keep the marring stuff. So now we can uh, find something to use as the pusher and then we'll uh, give one a shot. We have to um, reset our work in the jaws here. Let me put my gloves on just so I don't burn myself on that. It's not that hot, but not something I want to hold on to for a little bit. Important to make sure your jaws are going to be chips on them. You'll see how amazing it is. I've reset this piece of the truck about four times already. I had to check it off the lathe. It's pretty amazing how concentric this truck spins. You really can't see any wobble. I think it's about two thousandths, even less when you tighten all the pinions. We need a couple things. One of them I already have. The other one we're going to have to scrounge around for. Okay, so I got it all jigged up. I'll show you the setup once we're done. One thing I forgot to do on the mandrel was trim the flare. I should have trimmed the flare back a bit. A bit. So we're gonna not trim it on because it's probably gonna tear because I annealed it. So we annealed it before uh, getting it in the setup. We need to be really careful with our jaws here. Go nice and slow. Okay. I'm gonna go get a spinning tool. I'm gonna use a whale tool. Did you hear that, Colin? I said a funny joke. I said, I have a feeling the We're also gonna up our speed. We're going to 600. Give us a little less shown. Soap it up, soap it dope. because I left the thing way too long. Let me get a trimming tool. Kind of trim that back a bit. So let me take you around here. So that's the craggy bit. Don't worry about the craggy bit. If I would have trimmed this back like I should have, it wouldn't have happened, but look at that. So that's my setup, just a plastic disc. And this really should be one piece with this to make it easier getting it out. I'm gonna super glue them later. So let's break it down. Let me turn this off. Let's break it down and see what we got. So these are just gonna fall out of the way. Don't mind them. Wow. That is sweet. Let me get the tail stock out of the way. The one thing that's like maybe a little clunky about this setup is having to move the tail stock every time. That's really not that bad. Okay, so let me put you back on a tripod so I don't tear my fingers open on that craggy bit. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. That's the fucking way to do it. Wow. That is just absolutely the way to do it. We have absolutely no flat spot on the seam. It's a little craggy because I left it long, but we'll be okay. See how it's tapered out like that? That's okay with me because honestly, that means that it won't get stuck on this mandrel, which would suck. And that's very easy to taper back in on the lathe, but that's what we want. And there's no deformation in here. This is perfect. What we have to try is different bell shapes if they fit this mandrel properly. That's the only thing I really don't know about because if I have to have a different one of these rings for each mandrel, at least right now in my level of production, I am not interested in that. Holy shit. I think the French were onto something with this one, boys. That's freaking amazing.